technology is often a fillip to progress, such as mobile phones in a developing world. Could microgrids do the same thing? We travel to India to see a simple technology that could have a big impact. India aims to produce 50% of its total electricity from non-fossil fuel sources by 2027, a far more ambitious goal and larger percentage than the 40% by 2030 target set out by COP21. And helping the country to achieve these ambitious renewable goals are scientists at the Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology. India cannot afford to waste the energy, so where there was an option made for our renewable energy, so India has grasped it as quickly as possible. The institute describes itself as one of the top engineering institutes in the country and was classified as an institute of national importance by the government of India in 2014. We're having breakthrough in the biotechnology and we are having breakthrough in the nanotechnology as well as the renewable energy sources. The fast growth of green energy projects over India has caused some technical challenges, not least in how to connect together such diverse forms of power. This is one of the key focus of the team here and its lead engineer, Professor Saha. When you want to connect it to the utility grid, then it has to be synchronized properly. Solar is already synchronized, but the biogas is not usually synchronized. Then you have to develop a synchronizer and the control for the uh, not only among the generators of microgrid, but also the utility grid. That needs, that's a challenging task, but we are developing it. The institute decided to look into microgrids and created India's first combined microgrid for solar, wind and biogas. The original idea of microgrid is to provide your 24 by 7 access to electricity. So you must have a combination of sources, integration of different sources, and dependable sources to get energy on demand. Now, solar and wind is not under your control. It is not energy on demand. But biomass, that is under your control. So if we combine the solar and wind, that will give you a 24 by 7 access to, uh, of, to electricity to the local people. The institution has a wind power generator, but that only provides around one kilowatt. It has a solar array, which can provide around 10 kilowatts and lastly has a biogas plant which provides 15 kilowatts. There is a sharing of energy generation from the solar or wind or the, uh, the biogas. So that control has to be developed. To maintain the electrical load and to back up when supply drops, the team here have designed their own redox battery. There is a special type of battery that uses liquids and membranes rather than traditional solid components. This is the first time we have introduced such a battery and we are actually interfacing the uh, battery with the, uh, with the grid and studying its uh, properties. And this is coming out very well. By 2060, India is expected to be the world's most populous nation, so getting its energy policy right is vital. The work of scientists like Professor Saha and his team can give us hope that the country is moving in the right direction, perhaps give us some lessons on what is possible. Many people think the 21st century will be the age of an electrical revolution, where electricity will be the driving force behind a whole range of technologies. We take a look at a breakthrough in the Netherlands that's already making an impact. The electricity we take for granted when we flick a switch follows a very convoluted route, normally passing from power station to power lines to substations to us. During this path, there are a lot of places where things can go wrong, and when it does, it can be quite catastrophic. For instance, in 2012, a power outage in India affected 620 million people, or 9% of the world's population, when around 32 gigawatts of capacity was taken offline. Nowadays, we are more reliant on electrical power, so when an outage happens, it has a big impact on our daily life. And that could be, for example, electronic banking, uh, internet access, telephone communication, public transport. But if you look like hospitals and data centers where critical power is more important, that could be more dangerous. Energy suppliers can tell when there is an outage, but isolating where and what the problem is is more tricky. 
In the current situation, the control center can see where a fault is, but it needs to send a technician on site to actually find out which part of the network, if it's a switch gear or cable, has actually failed. When he does this, he'll then safely uh, sexualize this area and then will try and restore power to the customers as quick as possible. But this can take up to one to four hours, depending on the complexity of the grid and also the location. Rotterdam is home to Europe's largest port, so the city has some pretty serious power needs. We served more than 2.1 million customers. We served a, a, a third part of the Netherlands. Three major cities, Utrecht, The Hague and Rotterdam, but also the main port of Rotterdam, the Rotterdam Harbour. With that many clients, solving a possible supply problem fast is really important. To keep the reliability high, we need more intelligence in our grid. So we add computers. The self-healing grid is for us one of the ingredients to, to have a better supply to our customers. Rotterdam's distribution network, like many cities, consists of a mixture of old and new technology. Any IT system fitted into it needed to have a high level of flexibility. The self-heating system is an intelligent device which uses real-time data to monitor the substation. In the event of a fault, it will automatically reconfigure to ensure the power is brought back to the customers. They installed the system in seven substations in Rotterdam. These units are placed in different substations in the ring network. If a fault occurs, the T200 units will detect this and they will start communicating with each other. So what they will do is try to locate the faults using communication and diagnostics. When they've done that, they will safely and automatically sexualize those faults and then after that they will also safely try to re-energize and reconnect the other grid parts so that customers get the energy back as quick as possible. Intelligent systems like this mean that the supply companies can really improve their reliability, something particularly important as more and more sustainable energy sources are being plugged in. Sustainable energy is growing more and more, like the solar panels, wind turbines, charging of electric cars and maybe feeding back from these electric cars, and this plays a more important role. The automation systems will help the customers as having a more reliable network, which is more flexible for their use and also enhancing a better efficiency for operations. The grids we rely on have never been under so much pressure, but smart technology like this should help power companies keep us powered up. So the move from traditional to sustainable seems to be causing some delivery issues. What can you tell us about those? Well, sustainable power sources are fluctuating and that uh, requires much more controls and interventions than in the past. And how much electricity is actually lost when we think about the grid itself? On average, 5 to 10%, depending on the country. And when we think about the digital grid, what, what changes might that make? This is a good question. The power business is currently investigating how much of digital markets and share economy could enter their business. Um, we can expect some uh, changes, but the power systems are very highly regulated and it's lots of uh, very, very expensive investments. But as long as this market contributes to a safe, secure, reliable, affordable and green power system, be my guest. <laughs> How hard will it be to integrate the two systems, the traditional one and also the digital systems too? The next 50 years we will have a, a transition. We will have a mix of both. Um, where traditional structures and traditional topologies will coexist with new emerging ones. Flexibility, demand and supply, all these things we've talked about. When we think about sharing electricity across borders, is that a concept that's possible? It's not only possible, it's very, very uh, wanted. Uh, the European Union incentivizes uh, investment into cross-border trade and cross-border connections. The stronger a connection between two areas, between two countries is, the lower the prices and the higher the availability. How realistic is it for us to look forward to a future where electricity is supplied without gas, oil or nuclear? Fuel-based generation will be a luxury issue for submarines, um, emergency cases, military applications. The bulk will and has to be renewable. We're going to see much more digital involvement in the grid, of course, but does that open us up to cyber attacks in the electricity industry? Well, we have one advantage. It's a cyber physical system. Yes, we have to harden the cyber part. We have to do the patches and the upgrades and so forth. But we also have physics and physics can help us 
we can detect attacks, we can counter attacks with the physics, and you can never fool physics. <laughs> you can never fool physics. It's a great way to end. Peter, thank you very much indeed. It's been fascinating talking thank to you. Thank you. It remains to be seen if this new electrical renaissance powers us to a greener future. But whatever happens, it's sure to play a vital part in the mix. So next time you flick a switch, spare a thought for the people and technology behind the power source that we take for granted the most. As always, we want you to get involved. So join the conversation on Twitter, at CNBC Energy, using the hashtags AskSE and Sustainable Energy. Share your thoughts with us and we can put your questions to our experts. Our next episode is the last in the current series, so we'll be taking a look back at all the energy sources we've covered and how they're all inextricably linked to one resource water. We'll be taking a look at H2O and how it's vital not only for our health but the health of a sustainable planet and its energy resources. Until then, keep thinking green. Goodbye. Goodbye. Still watching? Perfect. Click here to watch another great video from CNBC International. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.